our team. Uh, some of our tutors couldn't come uh, due to their professional uh, job task. And today we will have, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Marvin here. Uh, he's uh, one of, he graduated from uh, Philippines as an architect. And then he continued uh, studying at the Singapore U University, National University. But before that, uh, Marvin already have a, a lot of experiences uh, related to design ar as an architect, as a developer, uh, plan developer planning. And now you are also specialized in a healthy, related healthy architecture, isn't it? Yeah. Healthcare. No, Mar healthcare. Mar healthcare. healthcare. Okay. Healthcare uh, architecture. And now Marvin is, uh, he lives uh, in London, UK, and time is yours, Marvin. You can also okay. introduce, make a short introduce okay. of yourself. It's also fine for me. Okay, thank you very much, Midi. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, um, I'm from the Philippines. I finished architecture. Sorry, um, I, I'm receiving some feedback, so at this point, can I just request for mute? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, Thanks. sorry. Sorry about that. So, um, good afternoon, uh, Indonesia. So, I think, is it um, Salamat Tengahari or Salamat Siang? Or, yeah. So, um, so as uh, briefly mentioned, my name is John Marvin. So, I'm, I'm Filipino. I graduated architecture in 2004. Uh, I worked for four years, and then in 2008, I did my master's in Singapore, where I, where I met Aji, who was my classmate and teammate in some studio works. And then after that, so um, if you are architecture or urban design students, uh, what I'm just going to say is the, the variety of, of career options you could have, because after I did my master's, I initially worked for landscape design. And then I work for um, regional real estate master developer, which is Ascendas now part of Capital Land, <clears throat> which has presence all over um, Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia. And then I also work in healthcare um, from Chang Hospital being in-house as a client to designing hospitals being part of uh, B plus H of Canada. Uh, we were designing the Singapore General Hospital uh, Emergency Department building. And then I came to UK in 2017 with my family. I, my first work here was with Liberata Architects. Uh, we were doing um, industrial master plan in the UK context and also public housing. And then after a year, uh, I rekindled my relationship with, with healthcare architecture. So I work with Gillingdon Architects wherein I'm involved with um, at least two um, major new build hospital in the country. And, and last October, I just transferred to Rider Architecture, um, still continuing on, on um, healthcare. So <clears throat> um, yeah, so that just gives you a brief information about me and later on we can discuss um, what I'm about to share. So, um, Okay, um, can you now um, see my screen? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what they're seeing is the is an aerial view of Naga City. Now Naga City, <clears throat> it's not a very big city. Um, it's not a metropolis. It is a small private city um, in the province of Camarines Sur. Uh, for many years. Um, Naga City was not really growing. 
you know, it's, I would say, uh, one of the backwaters of the Philippines. It's not as progressive as, as many parts of the country. It's not as, as populous. Um, but in the last, I would say, in the last 15 years, there has been a considerable interest in the region. Um, growing up, and I consider myself from Manila, um, how I look at Naga City is uh, it, it's part of the Bicol region. Now in the Philippines, we divide ourselves into region more from an ethno-linguistic linguistic group um, driven by our language, dialects. So Naga is part of the Bicol uh, group, uh, Bicol, di Bicol dialect. Now, uh, my image of Naga City lately is we, it came to our um, senses primarily due to its um, eco tourism. And, but other than that, you would associate Naga City uh, from its distant uh, cousin, which is Legazpi City, because of the volcano. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to um, proceed now. So, this is the outline that I was given, um, reconfirming the location. Now, what kind of disaster that regularly happens in the Philippines? How do citizens react? How traditionally do people see disaster? Does the government have disaster management? Are there, low, are there any national regulations and buildings perhaps related to tradition? Is the local wisdom, uh, what is the local wisdom regarding architecture? So for today, I'm gonna cover item one to four. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, um, today's session will be very technical. So um, it's not very architectural, but it's more of just um, orienting you on the flavor of the city. I will reserve the technical matters on the second part, on the second session. So Nagas is, is a city in the Philippines located in the Bicol region, along with the twin primate cities of Legazpi. Uh, you know, it's some text very long. Uh, it, 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 it is a political economic uh, region. So in terms of location of Naga City, that is the distances. So it's, a, it's roughly around four hours of flight, flight time. As I mentioned earlier, the colors, the groupings that you see, they are more divided uh, according to ethno-linguistic uh, boundaries in the Philippines. So just for your information, so this is Indonesia. Uh, Malaysia, Br Brunei, and the Philippines to the north. So uh, Manila over here is the nation's capital. And Naga City is over here, which is the, um, which is the economic capital of Camarines Sur, but not the uh, political capital. So that's Nag Naga. So um, in many years, the way to travel to Nagas has always been defined either by rail or by road. So Naga is located at the confluence of Naga and Bicol rivers, which has influenced its history, culture, and commerce. The plain where it is located is punctuated by Mount Isarog and the mountain ranges of Lagonoy Karamoan, which protects it from Pacific Ocean. So over here is the Pacific Ocean. So that's where um, the usual storms are coming from. So in the season, we have two general, in the, in the Philippines, we have two general season. We have the wet and dry. So um, basically um, cooler months, which is from December to February, the air would be coming from the north North, uh, northwest. So that's when we enjoy cooler months. But um, wet season coming from um, June to probably September, it's, it's coming from Pacific Ocean. So that's where the storms are usually coming. Now, this is the geography as you can see. So it, Naga is, is in a low lying of uh, basin uh, bounded by mountains on left and right. And this is just a satellite uh, image of how Naga City in context of Mount Isarog. Uh, Mount Isarog is not an active uh, volcano. It's considered um, a dormant slash extinct 
So it has erupted thousands of years ago, uh, but, but it still lies within the Pacific Ring of Fire. Um, yeah, so this is an aerial view of the city in context of the mountain. So in terms of image and identity, they go hand in hand. Uh, this is the climate. So from March to May, it's dry and hot. June to October is typhoon season. November to February is cooler season. Uh, so sorry, uh, at any at any point in time, if you have a burning question about what I'm saying, just just interrupt me rather than hold it towards the end, so we can have a more interactive discussion. So these are the ranges of temperatures uh, for the city. I would say it's not far from uh, Indonesia nor Singapore. And these are some recent uh, satellite um, images. So this is uh, Typhoon Ambo of last year. So it just gives you the, the a scale understanding of how big this typhoon. Imagine this is the whole country and this is how big the typhoon is. Um, so Naga, formerly known as Nueva Cáceres, has a culture influenced by its rich, rich religious history, geography, and produce. So it has the following uh, festivals. So when I say Nueva Cáceres, um, a, a side note here, um, the Philippines was discovered by Portuguese explorer commissioned by the Spanish court, uh, Ferdinand Magellan. The original um, purpose of that voyage is to, number one, to find for Spain uh, the islands of Molucas, which is now the, a province of Indonesia. And that is in search of uh, spice, because prior to that, there was a treaty dividing the world between the two colonial powers of Spain and Portuguese. So by right, anything on the eastern side of that line, including Philippines, Indonesia, should belong to Portugal. Now, Spain wants to um, have a cut of that lucrative spice market. So they commissioned uh, Magellan to search for Molucas Islands, which is now part of Indonesia, but wrongly landed in the Philippines. So that's how we were uh, discovered. And when the Spanish um, came to colonize the country, um, they they uh, founded um, initially five regions. Uh, you have Cebu, Manila, Iloilo, and one of them is, is Nueva Caceres. And these are regional centers. So we could say that during Spanish time, um, Naga has more prominence. So um, this is a, a, a snapshot of Peña Francia festival. So um, part of the Spanish legacy is a very strong Catholic religion. In terms of religious history, so uh, the Philippines as a, as, a, as a people, as a country, we started, we started um, the human migration story of the Philippines is probably somewhat similar to Indonesia. So uh, during uh, millions, uh, sorry, um, the earliest human migrations were the Aborigines coming from the um, Ice Age uh, bridges. And then it, 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 were, it was followed by uh, human migration from the Indonesian archipelago. And then it was followed by the uh, Malay uh, migration from uh, Borneo. So that, that constitutes our racial uh, mix. So we are descendants of Aborigines, um, Indonesian, Indones and Malays. So before the, um, so, so having said that, sorry, where I'm heading to religious history, having said that is um, from Aborigines, we have um, tribal beliefs up in the mountains. When the Indones people came, um, they brought the part of a Srivijayan culture. And then when the Malays came, uh, we were an archipelago, essentially a Muslim archipelago. So when the Spaniards came in the 16th century, there was a process of conversion of the islands from, from Muslim, essentially, to Catholicism. And th that has played part uh, strongly in our history. So Peña Francia uh, 
is one of the festival that is being carried out in many parts of the country. And it has a, repeat, uh, a repeating theme of, 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 a, of an image coming from uh, peninsular Europe, which is uh, Spain or France, being brought to the Philippines and how that, that image has brought miracles locally. So Peña Francia shares that story. So um, now uh, when people talk about Naga, um, traditionally you would associate it with Peña Francia festival. So it, they have a very strong um, uh, devo devotion to uh, uh, Mary, the mother of, of Jesus. Now, um, what this map just shows is the fluvial, is the root of Peña Francia. So it's one of the few, if I can recall, probably two, two festivals in the Philippines were in, they would parade the image of Mary on a fluvial parade down the river. So this is quite unique in this city. So what, does, what that gives you as, as probably an urban designer is the importance that river plays to the identity of the city. So this is, uh, these are some photos of the Fluvial Parade. So this is uh, Naga River and that's the, the image. And there's that floating up um, barge being, traditionally being pulled by rows of, of, of uh, fishermen. Uh, but what that also gives you, if you would like to understand the photo is how the banks have evolved now. Uh, so that gives you an, an indication of, of uh, flooding in the city. So again, some, uh, some more of aerial photos. And quite strikingly on this part, what you would see is a Taoist, Taoist temple. Now, um, I mentioned in our um, human migration history that, that we have um, Aborigines, Indonesians, and Malays. But what is also strong in the Philippines is its pre-colonial trade links with China and subsequent um, Chinese migration to the Philippines. So if, if you would look at the Filipino people, the core composition would be the Aborigines, which is Igorot, Malay, and, and Indonesia. But then on the surface, you would have the Chinese migrants. So on this note, I could probably compare it to Indonesia wherein you have your core, um, Indonesia or Malaysia, wherein you have your core pribumi um, identity, and then you have that Chinese um, layer. So, and so over time, that composition has played a good mix in the identity of, of the land, in the culture of the land. Now, in terms, uh, in terms of food, Kinalas Festival is a local festival that they um, hold uh, wherein they celebrate their local cuisine, more of uh, this one, Kinalas. Now, this one on the left, why it's um, highlighted, it's called the Bicol Express. And Bicol Express is characterized by spicy uh, flavor. Um, Bicol as a region is known for producing um, sp spice. So, um, th their food have gradually been identified as the most um, spicy in the Philippine um, context, but um, obviously um, from the Philippine, from the Indonesian context, it's probably not as spicy as Indonesian food. Now, Naka is an urban area within a two kilometer radius. It has historic structures, transport, connectivity, commercial retail centers, um, educational and sporting facilities. In terms of physical context, if you would uh, draw a circle over it, the maximum is around two kilometer radius. So it's not very big. Um, one could argue that you could easily run from the center to, the, to these fringes. Um, so in terms of the um, aerial view you have here, winding through the cities, the Naga River, then um, over here is the Metro Metropolitan Cathedral. Um, it's interesting to note that in the Philippines, in many towns, especially those founded by Spain, um, 
the way it was planned was uh, following the Spanish uh, laws of the Indies or Leyes de las Indias. Now what that sets is a basic um, township planning where in, you, in, in consideration of a nearby water source, land profile, and then the location of the church fronted by a plaza next to educational or religious facility, then surrounded by the principalia or the uh, primary families. Now, in terms of transport, uh, a distance from the city, which is this one is the Naga City Airport. It is, it is not a big airport. It's, it's, a, it's a provincial airport. It only has a flight, regular flights to Manila and nothing else. So it doesn't receive much traffic. Uh, in terms of rail connectivity, so this is Manila and that is Naga City. Um, the rail uh, infrastructure in the country was initially built by the um, Spanish then improved by the Americans. But sadly, recently our rail infrastructure in the Philippines is very, very bad. Um, it's, you can't even compare it to Indonesia. Indonesia, I would say, is probably gold standard compared to Philippine National Railways. Um, but among the surviving lines in the country is the Bicol Express Line from Manila. This is the um, train station, and then you can see the tracks around it. And then you could uh, probably um, observe the more of the regular communities versus the uh, informal communities around rail. And then uh, next to it are our bigger new developments. Later on, I could have a more interactive um, Google map um, discussion. So this is just a photo of the Metropolitan Cathedral in terms of architecture, it's following Baroque architecture. So most churches in the Philippines built by the Spaniards uh, are following um, Romanes and Baroque architecture. Romanes with regards to its um, structural uh, design, you have thick walls, but comparing it with the true Romanes style, Philippine churches tends to be, I would say, sh short and fat because of the prevalence of earthquakes. So in terms of ratio, it's more wide and it's more stunted. But uh, with Romanes, you would have your, your, your thick bearing walls with, with buttresses. Now, with regards to um, ornamentations, they would try to follow Baroque architecture, which is the excessive use of, of, uh, fini of, uh, of, of ornaments. Uh, when, the, when the Americans came at the turn of the 20th century, uh, one of the first uh, programs they introduced is, is education. During the Spanish um, colonial time, education was reserved for those who, who can afford to the rich families. So people who are tilling the land, farmers, they were not educated at all. It's only reserved for people with money. But when the, Amer when the Americans came, they introduced massive school building program in the country, especially in the uh, far flung provinces. And one typology of that is the Gabaldon, uh, which is the spelling, uh, which you would see in many places in the, in the country. Uh, the striking feature is that three arch um, entrance to the building. Uh, and it has survived um, 100, of, 100 years already. Um, now, in terms of um, architectural penchant, we have always associate um, religious architecture with neoclassical. Now, this arch was built only only a few years ago, and yet it was designed like a Roman arch, like you would see an arc of Titus or something like that. But this has been added uh, right in front of the cathedral. Now, Naga, as with other cities in the Bicol region, faces natural calamities, just typhoons, including flooding, um, rising seawater, gales, volcanic eruption threat, 
there's a, a nearby uh, famous volcano near Tanaga. You have earthquake threats. So that goes in terms of, of order of uh, uh, occurrence. So typhoons, the, it's interesting to know that the Philippines this country receives around 18 to 23 typhoons every year. And, and natural calamities has, has, all, has, has uh, it's already like a way of life for the country. It's, it's nothing to be, um, it, it regularly happens. Uh, volcanic eruption, uh, volcanoes erupts in the country, one, one volcano to another probably erupts every five years. Earthquake, uh, we experience earthquake, um, minor earthquakes very regularly, but in terms of major, we would experience one major earthquake probably um, every 15 years or every 20 years. Now, countries with, with most natural disasters. So on that note, the Philippines shares some identity with Indonesia. And this is a hazard map of the country. Now, the Naga City is located somewhere here. Interesting to note this color, um, as an architect, what you would understand it, when we are designing our structure is that almost the entire country this one, we classify it as, as a zone four, and that is with regards to, to risk against earthquake. Whereas Palawan Island over here is a zone three. So Palawan is the one that is nearest to Borneo. Um, this one is nearest to Celebes Sea. So that is influenced primarily because of the uh, Philippine Trench over here and the Marianas Trench. And what you see here are fault lines uh, fronting near the Pacific Ocean. So along this line is also where you would see many volcanoes, uh, very prominent volcanoes in the country. You have Pinatubo, um, Taal, uh, Mayon, and so on and so forth. And that is again part of the um, larger Pacific Ring of Fire, of, of which Indonesia is also part of. Um, this is a, what they consider the strongest typhoon for the year 2020, Super Typhoon Roli, uh, last November. And again, it gives you the scale of, of the typhoon as compared to the size of the country. And these are the photos wrecked by that um, uh, by that typhoon. We have floodings. In regards to a volcanic threat, um, this is Mayan volcano. This is the an, now Mount Isarog. This is what I said a uh, a dormant extinct volcano, but Mayan volcano is a very active volcano. It erupts every every five years at least. Um, interesting, you have a uh, Legaspi city at the foot of Mayan volcano, as how you would have dug on the foot of Mount Isarog. So that's why I'm saying that in the Bicol region, you have Naga and Legaspi as a uh, two twin uh, primate cities. And that's a, a photo of Mayan volcano. It is our version of Mount Fiji in terms of having a perfect cone. So it's famous by having a perfect cone, one of the few uh, volcanoes around the world. It's also famous because while it's erupting, almost life goes on, on this city. And people can see how, how it happens all, all the time. With regards to earthquake, these are the recent uh, strongest earthquakes that has happened in the country. 1990, uh, it was a very strong earthquake. It has killed uh, thousands of lives. It was very devastating. And then in 2013, we have the, now Luzon is in the Northern part of the country. This, if you think of, of, of Philippines, it's basically three regions. You have Luzon on the North, Visaya on the, on the middle and Mindanao on the South. Um, so Visaya, um, had this strong earthquake in 2013. 
but interesting, uh, many of the damages that happened in that uh, earthquake was more towards a uh, heritage religious structure. It's, it's, it's because following the 1990 earthquakes, the country has been uh, more strict with regards to structural design because they don't want to repeat what happened in this um, earthquake. Now, how do we look calamity? We have this Filipino word called bayanihan. Now, bayanihan, um, this word, it, it comes from the root word bayan, which means community or town or city center. So bayan is, is a physical place and and uh, so you have Bayan, which is a physical uh, place. Then you have Bayani. If you stop here, Bayani. Bayani means a hero. And Bayanihan means it's a community spirit. So, so when you say Bayanihan, it, it is a collective sense or collective identity where in people of the same town, in times of natural calamities, they act as brothers in terms of helping each other. So um, that is how we have drawn our resilience um, traditionally, even without the formal support of national government. And that has uh, been shown. Um, this is not in Bicol. But this is in uh, Samar Leyte region, which is in the next region um, southwest of Bicol, which is just right next to that, uh, wherein we had the typhoon Haiyan in 2013, which is the strongest typhoon that happened in, in, in around 200 years globally. And it has broke many records in regards to the, the, the strongest wind and also in terms of, of uh, devastation and, and deaths. The unofficial death toll for this typhoon is around 10,000. And why I'm having this photo shown is because for around, for at least around two days, this whole region was um, not reachable by the national government. So there was no power, no water, no nothing. And, and national government can't even come in because all the roads and bridges were either destroyed or blocked. So the people had to find resilience in their own. And it has, uh, again, uh, Filipino people in terms, of, in terms of natural calamity, um, they look at their fate they look at it as a sign from, from God, either to, to be more faithful or to turn away from sin. And, and it is that faith that, that, that is shown, especially in this, in, well, even if it's flooded, people still attend masses. And on the right, in the face of the calamity, people would save their religious images over their other belongings. So it is that strong devotion and these are photos by a local, um, local um, disaster response team. And in terms of outlook, so this is our sense of humor. It's because that we have been visited by flooding regularly, that we know that it comes and it will pass, that we, we still find time to, to be fun and happy. So maybe on that note, we share some identity with Indonesians because we are always happy. We're always up, you know, we're always positive. So even though people are dying, we, we can still smile. So here, it's, the community is flooded. People still go out and drink. And on, on this right, even when, when the last eruption of Man Volcano was happening, people still post for their uh, wedding picture. In, in Legazpi City. So that just shows you how we look at, 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 at uh, disasters. Now, with regards to resilience, um, we have a National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, and it is aided or partnered by numerous private 
and quasi-public organization. These are just uh, some snapshots of websites of those. So the NDRRMC, now excuse me, I don't, I don't understand why they have to call for that name, very hard to <laughs> memorize. Um, but what it shows you is they have an, a real-time um, monitoring with regards to earthquake, tsunami, volcano, rainfall, flood, gale, and so on and so forth. Now with earthquakes, I've mentioned that we are part of the uh, Pacific uh, Ring of Fire. So that's why we are susceptible to um, earthquakes. The Philippine, in terms of tectonic, tectonic plates, it has its own plate, which is called the Philippine plate. The Philippine plate is continuously crushing with the Pacific plate over at the uh, Philippine trench, which by the way is the second most deepest trench in the world next to Mariana's Trench. So that um, has always been a potent source of earthquake. Within the country, there are um, active uh, fault lines. Tsunami, we are fortunate that um, we are not, or we have not been damaged so much as compared to our neighboring countries. But in the Southern region, which is Mindanao, uh, Several tsunamis has happened there. And I don't know whether because it's nearer to Indonesia, which is which has a big threat of tsunami. Volcano, I've mentioned, we have several volcano already. Rainfall, uh, general flood. In terms of flood, our flooding either comes from storm, burst um, water reservoirs, or basically wrong way of urbanization. And gale, which is strong winds uh, among the ocean currents. And this has caused um, water rivers to, to rise. Now, when I showed Typhoon Haiyan, um, the, the destruction in that, in that uh, locality was primarily caused by gale and not by typhoon, not by, not, not by rainfall, sorry. What happened is because of the strong winds, it pushed the water current uh, from Pacific Ocean to abnormally rise. So within a matter of seconds, many, the whole town was flooded by waters that is um, higher than a human height. So it will take several hours for the rain to generate that, that, that level of flood waters, but the strong wind pushed water from Pacific Ocean. And um, in response to, to typhoons, um, the country has developed these hazard maps uh, developed by the Department of Science and Technology, specializing on volcanology and seismology. Now, what this hazard map shows is hazard against, hazard against, um, uh, number one, against earthquake, against vo volcano, against landslide. So it's more geography driven. And locally, uh, they have developed a um, um, master plan for the Bicol River Basin. So the Bicol River Basin includes Naga City. Now it's a national, it's developed by this national agency. So it shows you how, how they intend from a policy perspective, intend to manage um, that, that uh, resource from natural resources to um, um, infrastructure development. Um, evacuation centers, um, this is the latest types of evacuation centers that you would see in the country. Now, traditionally, um, whenever calamities happens, the, the evacuation centers in the country are the churches. So that's why they were built like Romanes with thick, thick walls. So during times of calamity, people run into the church. But when, when some churches gets, gets crumbling down because of earthquakes, so they thought it's not the, safe, it's not the safest place to run into, so they next look at, at schools. 
school buildings to be the evacuation centers. And then to complement that recently, are, they are developing this um, open sheds, which are usually used for, for um, covered sporting um, courts like basketball. And in times of evacuation centers, they have procured this pop-up tent, which can easily provide a shelter for one family. And this is one of the uh, private um, foundation that is always there to provide um, help during calamity. So they specialize more on, on feeding and, and other goods. Um, and they are usually being chaired by celebrities to generate uh, more uh, funding donations. So that's it. That is very short. Again, uh, it's a very short discussion. Now, um, if you want, what I could show you is uh, just a bit of uh, discussion here. The, um, again, that, that is Manila. So that's the, from the region, yeah. So if you look at the city in more detail, you can say that the older part of the city is on this side of, of Naga River, primarily because of the presence of the Naga Cathedral, which, which again follows that uh, laws of the Indies, wherein uh, a church would first be, a church site would first be selected on the, on the ground that has prominence over a body of river, and you would have a plaza and a seminary or a religious facility, so seminario, which also functions as school. You have the Archbishop's Palace, and then surrounding it would be the uh, Principalia or the um, residence, a residence of the uh, wealthy residents. And it goes from there going out. So that's, and then. When the Americans came, or when infrastructure came, they put the rail station on the south. Prim uh, could be because that is where you would have more available land. And usually near or opposite the, the town center is where the, the commercial um, area would develop, which is this area. Now, it's also fitting that the real station was built there, uh, probably around 80 years ago. And in terms of many cities in the Philippines, where you would have the commercial centers is where you would have the local um, communities for the Chinese. Now, um, on, on the southern side is where you would have uh, more recent developments. Uh, we are a country of shopping malls. So SM is the uh, biggest developer of shopping malls in the country. Um, this Coliseum um, was developed, uh, aside from providing um, sporting uh, facility, it also acts as a uh, evacuation center for the city, especially during Typhoon Rowley. And um, over here is the airport. And when I say that uh, from a Filipino myself, my image of Naga City is more on ecotourism. That's primarily driven by this um, development where they de de develop from nothing a uh, water sports complex. Yeah, so there are, you can, there are still many layers that we can still think about in terms of improving the city. Um, we can say that the design along the river has not yet been maximized and things like that. So on this note, if you have any um, question or ans questions or you'd like to discuss. Yes, uh, thank you, Marvin. It's a really comprehensive information for us about the uh, Philippines and Naga City and also the citizens. 
uh, Filipinos, I mean. So mm -hmm. uh, there's already a question from Angeline. Uh, perhaps you could see it in chat. Uh, see what uh, or Angel, uh, could you read? She ask about uh, people's majority outlook of the government's in the force in handling disaster. And okay. Okay. About this about satisfaction with the government's okay. effort. Okay. So, yeah. with regards to um, outlook. Um, I would say it, it has been improving. Um, following the 2013 Haiyan um, Typhoon, the key changes that the government has done is that from the national government, they have developed this regional disaster risk management. So what they do is in every major city, they establish a team and, and more than that team is that they pre-position um, assets. So this includes um, rescue boats, heavy equipment, emergency food and water supply. So that is the key changes. Um, when Typhoon Haiyan happened, the government heavy equipment could not reach the city because the, the relief the relief um, goods can could not reach the city because the roads were blocked. It, it were many many big trees fell along the highway, so they had to be cut, which takes time. That they cannot bring water, and the the airport was damaged. the The runway was all cracked, so no no military plane could land. So that was the biggest problem then, and that's what made the the fatality higher. So they think they, they thought that only if they could preposition. So at least when when big calamity happened and they, this city gets cut off, then they have local supplies. They could help themselves. So the outlook has been improving. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and. Angeline, uh, are you satisfied with the answers or you still have some questions? Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, I would like to, I would like, uh, uh, how, how can we say it? Uh, in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, most of the people are uh, quite, uh, they, they look at the government quite, I could say maybe quite negatively because uh, first uh, we know that uh, a lot of uh, help, like the food rations that uh, should be delivered to the people are usually uh, lost in the process uh, because there are a lot of co corruption issues <laughs> like that. Yes. Uh, and I would like to know about the, uh, 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 the Philippines government, mm -hmm. maybe uh, I would just like to compare maybe. <laughs> on, on that note, we share a very similar, uh, very similar um, history on that. Oh. Um, typhoon Haiyan was the strongest typhoon in, in many hundred of years. Now, when that happened and because of the devastating destruction, there was massive um, aid that was generated globally. Many rich countries all over the world gave money to the Philippines. And um, without sounding very much political, but basically that typhoon is what caused the previous administration to, to lose in the national election in 2016. It's because from 2013, when it happened to 2016, they saw the pace of rede redevelopment as being um, very, um, they're very, very slow. They were very much dismayed or even angry. Um, we are an independent country, but the first relief, relief or the first water that reached the city of Leyte 
was aboard a milit uh, an American um, military asset, which has to come to the Philippines aid. And we keep saying that, why do we always have to rely for America during this, this, this time? Can't our government do something for us? So it was very negative at that time. There was a lot of cover-ups with regards to the number of deaths. So basically they stopped counting when the bodies reach around 7,000 or 6,000 mm -hmm. because they, the government mm -hmm. just said, just stop counting. And there was a local chief during the typhoon who said on radio that the, the death toll could have been 10,000 and immediately was fired. So that's the that's the that's that's where the corruption is. The the reconstruction, the types of, of houses that was reconstructed in that region was very poor. So it was very it was very bad. So, but again, that is more attributed to the previous administration. Although the pre so. It, it, it's what really caused why the previous administration or the previous political party lost in, in, the, in the national elections and in many local um, election districts. So that's how, how bad it is. And, and that's what people are, are appreciating in the current government because they have seen, that's why when I was showing the, the recent photos, they can see that, hey, why can't we, why, why we have not done this before? Previously, evacuation center is you have one big shed and people are just sleeping on the ground. And men, women, and children are all in one place. So you have no pri privacy, no dignity. And, and so the government is saying that while you cannot stop natural calamity from happening, at least for our evacuation center, we can allow families some privacy and dignity because some of them, could, could be back to their houses in a matter of hours, or some could take weeks. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. John. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And there's also a question from Said about the okay. uh, disaster mitigation strategy, especially for typhoons in terms of architecture. Do you have a traditional vernacular architectural methods? Okay, um, on this note, I would like you to, to ask a lot of this question because I know this could be the one that could make or break in the, in the competition. Uh -huh. uh, throw them now and I will prepare things for the second session. As mentioned, yes. this session mm -hmm. won't be technical. But with regards to strategies, um, I, would, I would say sadly, sadly, our vernacular architecture has not been modernized. Filipinos, when we think of vernacular structure, we would still think of traditional um, um, Nipa hut, Quonset hut, or even Torogan, which is more Indonesian. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, our Contemporary buildings or modern building, it, it has no, it, it doesn't have that flavor in it anymore. So that is a sad reality that we face as a nation. Our built architecture now basically has no connection to, to our um, cultural identity. Or maybe that would be our cultural identity in the future. I don't know. Okay. And uh about the design you will we will discuss it on friday right yes so to, yeah. today is not very much architectural yeah precisely okay, okay. Yeah. any questions um can i ask a second question yes, yes please. please um thank you for your um presentation so um i was wondering if um the filipinos have um a good awareness in terms of climate change right now. Um, do the people of Philippines often associate uh, the frequent disaster that happen every year to climate change or um, is there a lack of um, uh, awareness in terms of climate change? I would say yes. Um, I would say yes because when people in the West were preaching about 
climate change, we are feeling it on the ground. The, the strength and the uh, frequency of typhoons, of super typhoons becomes stronger. So when Metro Manila was flooded in 2009, which has never been flooded that before, they say, oh, that's one in a hundred years. And then super typhoon Haiyan happened four years after. And then they say, oh, that's, that's one in 200 years. And then we have another super typhoon and then followed by many super typhoons. So now we are no longer counting the typhoons, we are counting the super typhoons that they say happens every 100 years. So that is our awareness on climate change. But then the question is, what are we doing about it? Um, we are not doing enough. So that's the long and short. Um, the country is still industrializing with regards to growth uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, we, we still, we, we look at industrialization as a necessary short-term path to, re, to, re, to raise our income levels. So that is why there is that natural tendency from that. Our energy mix used to be, we, we used to be one of the leaders in, in the Southeast Asian region back in the 70s with regards to renewable energy sources. We used to be the leading um, country with regards to harnessing hydroelectric geothermal energy, but that proportion has slowly uh, went down. So in the last 20 years to cover that, that uh, shortage in power supply, we have been building coal plants, which is not really environmental friendly. But um, this region, Biko region, is one of the regions that has a strong geothermal um, energy source. So that's a good thing to note. Um, is there, uh, is, is the, the answer uh, satisfied you, Said? Um, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Okay. John, for your answer. Yeah. Sorry, then, um, just to add on that, um, with regards to architecture, um, I know in Singapore, uh, we have the green mark. Um, in the Philippines, they have the council called, called Verde, which is green. And that is just our similar um, approach to architectural design to integrate um, sustainable uh, measure. Mm -hmm. But the problem on that is it has no teeth. If you look, it has no enforcement power. It's more of a, it's more of branding and commercial perspective that drives the adaptation of those policies over the, if you look at a carrot and stick approach, it's only carrot, there's no stick. It's not like in Indonesia where in the planning approval will not be approved if you don't satisfy uh, green mark points. In the Philippines, we don't have that as a tit for tat. So that is the sad reality. There are there are ground um, movement to, to, to change that, but it's not yet enforced nationally. Okay, thank you, I'm Marvin. Uh, there is still a question, but my question please, is, no, do, no, you please, still, please. do you still have time? It's okay, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. okay. I gave flowers to myself. Yeah. Okay, then if you still have time, there's a question about uh, the main livelihood of Philippines in Naga community. Oh, yes, and thank what, you for asking that. Yeah, I. And what can actually improving and actually can be improved and grow their economical rate? And what kind of resources that can be developed in the city? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for asking that. I forgot to highlight that. Um, <coughs> so, um, the Philippines comparing it with its neighbors in Southeast Asian region is not an agricultural powerhouse. But traditionally, that's how the region grew. Um, Bicol region traditionally grew from tobacco industry and, uh, and, and other produce. So it's basically farming. And then locally, you have a uh, fishing industry. And that has really slowed the progress, especially for the Bicol region. So if you go to the Bicol region in the 1990s, it was so backward. There was nothing there. 
Um, but um, in the last 20 years, in terms of the macro economy, there has been a, a big shift towards service industry, uh, primarily on BPO or call centers. And it takes advantage that Filipinos are quite good in speaking English. So that's why that, that industry allowed, allowed development to happen, not only in Manila, but in almost all major cities. So I am not for certain, but you will not be surprised if you would find call centers in Naga City. It could be because it's, imagine it as a Lego piece that you can plant anywhere. And as long as it, it has um, internet and power, it, local talents can go to it. So that has transformed the economy locally, number one, as from coming from farming. Number two, the 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 trend on Filipinos working overseas, including myself. So in, in the the trend of overseas Filipinos started in the 1970s. Um, initially, the lowest of low um, job types, and it's only in the last 20 years that the profile of Filipinos moving out of the country has changed. So. Nowadays, Filipinos working overseas uh, are taking up more professional jobs. Now, why I'm saying this is because this money that um, they are sending money to their relatives in the Philippines and the profile of, of overseas Filipino comes from many of them from many places, many from the poorest region. And when they, for example, went to UK, they earned pounds, they sent to Philippines. That's a direct money transfer. So from a traditional economy, you would take a foreign investor to build a manufacturing plant in a poor region. And that is investment that generates um, employment and income in a poor region. But in the case of the Philippines, while we have not enjoyed a fair share of FDIs, foreign direct investment compared to its neighbor countries, the overseas Filipinos globally send money and it's a direct money that gets to the poorest town and it, it spurs domestic consumption. So it, it, there has been articles where you have a very poor town and yet you would see a very uh, latest TVs, washing machine, etc. It's because the families there, they have money now earned in dollars or pounds foreign currency that they can buy. So that, that also fueled the growth of shopping malls. So why Naga? a second class city has a shopping mall, you know, because people there have money that a, a big percentage of each are earned from global sources, either from BPO or, or remittances. Yes, okay. Is the explanation uh, answered your question, Chauke? Or you still do you still have any questions? Uh, no, thank you, sir, for the explanation. Yeah. Um, uh, just for your information, you could we can still have this discussion for fifteen to thirty minutes time because uh, my next appointment. Okay. Yeah, and then the and the rest we just, will... just questions now. Yeah, and there's also a question about how long did do those disasters last, and what are the biggest problem for the people to survive? Okay. Um. It depends. When Typhoon Rolly happened in the Philippines last year, I remember it was a confluence of two or three typhoons happening days apart. So um, normally a typhoon, a typhoon would last uh, three days, sometimes two days. But when you have a series of typhoon happening one after another, there has been many cases where in the second typhoon, pulls the first typhoon back to the country because the usual path is that typhoon starts from Pacific Ocean. It crosses the Philippines. And in the Pacific Ocean, because it's hot, it becomes a super typhoon. And once it crossed the Philippines, it becomes a lower class typhoon, which is just a tropical uh, uh, depression, hitting Vietnam or hitting China or hitting Japan. That is, that is the usual trajectory. But there are cases where the second typhoon 
pulls the first one back. And and there could there are cases where you two typhoons merge into a big one. And that two, three days could be one week. So or 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 when you have series, it it weakens and it destroys eventually your defenses or your resilience. Like an evacuation center um, could be destroyed. Um, there are there are videos where, where in especially in, when in Typhoon Haiyan, people went inside the church because they think the the stone walls are very strong, but the the typhoon just sucked the roof out of the church. So that's how long it takes. Um, the, in terms of survival, uh, basically clean water. That is the number one. Um, requirements because when that happens, I don't know for what reason, but the water supply is cut off. There's no clean potable water. And that's where the second wave of disasters happen. There's a direct which is um, getting hit by the typhoon itself. The second is when you get um, sickness and malnutrition setting in. And do the people will come back to their uh, place again and rebuild the their house or they will move somewhere else um, they would again rebuild on the same place so that is uh, I think that's the Filipino resilience you know like you've been hurt in this place you still go to this place and build there and okay you can call it stupidity but we don't we, did, we didn't change our, our the way we build. You know, mm -hmm. we have experienced massive flooding in the city, and yet they nobody even bothered to think of developing emergency flood channels to, to drain mm -hmm. the, the floods when it happens. So that is maybe being resilient, or maybe that's being stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Fabas, how does it? Uh, is it uh, answer your question, Fabas? Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to add more. Uh, one more question: How is the how is the role of the how is the role of the church? Oh, okay, um, the role of the church um, during colonial times, the church has played a more central role in the Philippines, and that influence remains uh, strong. Um, they can always um, sway public policy for or against them. And now, they, um, they are also at the forefront in terms of providing shelter and food, but um, that role is also being complemented by many private organizations now. And that's why during um, post-calamity, you will see that many organizations are the ones who receive foreign funding because, or even the church receives the foreign funding because that in a way hopefully cuts corruption instead from channeling it to the government. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are still Muslims, many Sorry. Muslims there? Oh, Muslims. Many Muslims, yeah. Um, no, uh, I would say no. Um, the, this uh, religious history, um, Visaya, uh, before the Spanish came, we are a nation of many chieftains, many Datu or many Raja. And these are all relatives of the Brunei uh, monarchy. We have the Sultan in Sulu, we have, which um, still wields um, considerable in influence. Now, during the Spanish um, time, it was a success, successive and constant conversion from Muslims to Christianity. So, that's why as before East Timor, we are the only country in, in this side of the world that is a Christian country. So that is very strong in that. 
but there are regions still in Mindanao that are predominantly Muslims and they have Muslim law as their uh, law of the land in that area. And even in the country's capital, uh, Metro Manila, there is a thriving Muslim community there. Um, but not in Bicol region. There would be a Muslim, but it's not, it's not it won't be a, a big community. I see. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would like to ask, I would like to know about the youth, the youth of the Naga City. Are there many? Are they beautiful or? Um, well, the, the uh, Philippine demographics is a young, young demographics. Uh, where I'm coming from that is that, um, in terms of population pyramids and things like that, we are entering a population sweet spot wherein our working age takes the majority. We don't have much elderly, but our working age is the one where you have the population bulge right now. So I see. That, that gives you a young population with regards to workforce contributing um, resources to the state rather than taking it as pension. And, and that's a potent um, profile. Thank you, John. No problem. So um, on, on this point, uh, as we are wrapping up, um, I just want to know from all of you, what mm -hmm. do you want to see in my next session? Is, um, really, because um, where I'm coming from is I want to be useful when I do that second sharing session in terms of technical or architectural, um, try to ask me now or try to send me a message so that I could find resources for you. The, the last thing that I want is I just talk of, of, of very vague items that you cannot use in your design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, please write, uh, send on the chat, what would you like to have on our next session on Friday? And I think this is the last question from Oscar. It's about uh, any way to see the disaster in a positive terms, although you already explained it to us about the humor, some humor things, but uh, and are there uh, a kind of benefits from it or maybe agriculture field or something else from the disaster? Um, the in, in many disasters globally, um, they, they are look as a way to improve. In the Philippines, what happened is that um, the response to disaster has been improved. And this is something that we have seen on the ground. Um, it's very simple logic. When the meteorologists say that there's a big typhoon and the, and the path of the typhoon is this way, you cannot do something about it. You cannot alter the path, but what can you do? Number one, what are the resources that the people in that area needs? Number two, you tell the people that a typhoon is coming. So, sorry, number one is, is you tell the people that a, a, a typhoon is coming. So there is now a more coordinated information uh, being sent out um, from, from the na national government to to private media. They even have tried, um, the telephone companies have done uh, a text messaging to everyone when it's coming. So there's that, um, there's that um, layer where in now they have a police power where in they can force individuals to vacate their homes when they know that that area is in imminent danger. Previously, they would just tell people that you have to vacate, but people would be scared of their personal belongings, so they would not leave their house until it's, it's life-threatening. So now the authorities have that police power. Whether you like it or not, you have to be... If, if the police now has to drag you, or even at gunpoint, have to do that just for you to leave your house, they now have that power, and people are now understanding that. So that cuts um, uh, fatality by hips and bounds. They have pre-positioned goods. So 
in the country, we have this uh, food, food um, shed by the National Food Agency. And that provides food security with regards to stockpiles. So they say, why can't they also preposition relief goods or even those uh, pop-up tents? They are in the process of arming the local governments with heavy equipments, you know, from, from tree cutting equipments to, to rescue boats and even portable um, water treatment uh, um, equipment because that is, that is very crucial. In the first few hours of, of flooding and typhoon, people die of dehydration because they don't have access to clean water. So that's, those are the things that they are addressing. Now, in the, last, um, in, the la in the recent news, there was a problem in the Cagayan uh, region in the Northeast, where in um, complementing the rising floods of, from the rains, the water reservoir at the risk of, 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 um, of um, overflowing, they opened their floodgates. So it contributed to the flooding of the plains, contributed to the killings of the population. So what they're also improving is that coordination with the operators of the dam. So now when they know that a typhoon is coming and they now have Doppler radar to say, how much water that typhoon could bring, dams which, which maintains a water level in terms of water security, days before they will now start to release them. So they, they, will, they will now reduce it as much as possible. So when the, the, the typhoon comes, it won't overflow to the spilling level. So those are really positive. So what you're seeing now are positive changes in how the government um, deals with disaster, but what remains to be done is more on architecture and urban design. If you would compare it to developed countries, when, when San Francisco was devastated by earthquake, when London had the great fire, what did they change? They changed the way they rebuild. And that is architecture. And that is sadly we are not doing as a country, we are not doing as a people. The way we rebuild our cities is exactly or even worse than the first. If you think simple logic, if this Naga city is part of a floodplain, it has the primary rivers bisecting it, but have they developed um, emergency water retention? Where, where is the floodplain? Where is the uh, flood gonna course through to, to drain it quickly? There is none. How are the houses built against strong winds or, or surface runoff? None. So those are the things that from us, from architecture and urban design remains lacking. The operational side are being improved, but the way we build our environment is nothing is, is happening. If you compare it to UK, the way before you can build any housing, there are so many studies you need to do from investigating the soil, flood prone, flood risk, sorry, to many things, even environmental and, and habitats. These are the things that are not being done in countries like the Philippines. So maybe that is something that I could ask you, the students now, if you can, uh, after this session, try to Google this, these things, you know, and then, if, and then if you have questions, maybe send it to VD and then I could receive them so that I could um, focus that because that is really something we are not doing. You know, you know yeah. the way we build is not changing. Our building code is a building code that has been enacted in, in, the, in 1975, I think. So imagine the building technology in 1975 and that's what, almost 50 years ago has not changed so much I mean, in terms of policy, but the technology has changed so much. So it's not pushing the architects to really innovate. What we are doing, the architecture in the Philippines is that we are just looking externally to copy them. So those are the things that has to be looked at and improved. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marvin. And I think this is our, uh, yes, uh, it's really comprehensive uh, and very insightful for us, uh, your session today. We really hope to see you on Friday. Yes. Thanks, uh, thanks again for uh, your presentation. Uh, any no comment, uh, any words from IG? Nah. Uh, Martin is one of the smartest of uh, ah. in the class. That's why I choose him. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, yeah, uh, before we close the, our session, could you please uh, stop sharing? Oh, okay, of uh, course. Sorry, Martin, because we want to have a picture, and for your information, we also have a social media on Instagram about ITB Road to Dria. Maybe you also can take a look and see how how uh, our progress there. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, we are still thinking to have you on as a external uh, judges because due to the time uh, differences, that's um, our consideration. We still we still want to have you, but the, we want to arrange a possible time. Okay, if we, you, can, we can discuss yeah, that. Yeah, By the way, later. I think, correct me, um, Aji, but I I think I've been to ETP Bay yeah. uh, when we went to Bandung before uh, in 2009. Yeah, yeah and, and then we went oh, to yeah, yeah. after that. Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, but I, I, but I, 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 I didn't go to Bandung with, uh, with, with the team. Ah, okay. Yeah, so you've been at our university. Yeah. So again, uh, we will have a photo section, photo session, and we will close this uh, with a thank you so much. We already have some clues that I will uh, resume and send it to you via email. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Should I count? <laughs> okay, everyone, on three, one, two, three, smile. Next stage, one, two, three, smile. There you go. Okay, thanks a lot, Marvin. Here we have uh, IG and also Basco Tejo and uh, Heru Purbo. We also have Feisha, we also have Nisa, and uh, Aziz as a team of the studio. And uh, we still have like three others who couldn't come at this time. No problem. I, I yeah. hope you enjoyed uh, the sharing session today. Yes. When you find Very it much. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks you, a lot. Have Thank a you. nice day. No okay. stay, 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 yeah. safe. stay safe. Stay you, safe. Stay safe. All of you too. Yeah. Have a nice day. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Faye, uh, udah di save. Faye, chatnya? Chatnya dulu. Nah, jangan, kalau gitu jangan tutup dulu deh. Aku catat dulu ya. Hmm. Oh, direkam biasanya. Let me oh, print screen. Uh, Wait. Oh, aku bisa deng file aku rekam. Wait. Mama. Yeah. Eh, kelompokku kumpul di rumahku ya. <laughs> Kelompok. Kelompokku mumpuk di rumahku ya. Iya, Bapak di rumah, aku di rumahku sendiri. Aku tahu itu. <laughs> Oke, okay. aku tutup ini? ya. Pak Bas, aku ya, tutup. Bentar, ya. bentar, bentar, bentar. Vey, Vey, bentar, bentar. Aku belum. Oh, ibu masih ngopi. Rekam. Aku udah print screen sih. Oh, ya udah. Oke, okay. ya udah deh. Kalau gitu boleh. Silakan. Okay. Thank you. Vey, aku mumpuk di mana, Vey? Di rumah Bapak aja. Oh iya. <laughs> Enggak, ini di rumah imajiner. Rumah imajiner lagi. Di Bye. rumah online. Dah, Bapak. Thank you. Bye. Bye.